Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 97, Peace at Last. As autumn turned to winter, 1263, a year which had seen raids from English forces under Edward and John Lestrange, which had been creating chaos across Wales, the Welsh were ready to strike out once more. Llewellyn and his allies prepared to once again go on the offensive. First to help Griffith, he raided into Hereford, attacking Montgomery, Milton, Aston, and Chestrook, taking more lands from the Bishop of Hereford in the, at that point, and as we mentioned in the last episode, the bishop was an ally of Henry and Edward. Having Griffith in the alliance was helpful in pushing these successes in Clun and surrounding area. Llewellyn's ultimate goal was not just to seize territory, but it was also to do irreparable damage to Roger Mortimer, a marcher lord who had caused him a great deal of trouble and one of the strongest barons on Henry's side. In England, all through 1263, fortunes had changed quickly. First, Simon de Montfort was able to take lands in the south, including London. Many of those who were not in the nobility, and even some that were, had turned on Henry, in part because of what they perceived as being his overreach by taking back some of the power that he'd had before. And this, of course, would ultimately lead to some more of his troubles. The Welsh were not the only ones who had trouble with King Henry's overarching desires to do whatever he wanted. However, while Edward made little progress in Wales in 1263, he was able to put Montfort and his compatriots on the back foot for much of the summer and autumn, and finally they controlled much of the English countryside again. This is one of the driving forces behind Montfort's conversations with Llewellyn. Montfort had made a massive military gains in 1263, only to see them undone by allies who were only really interested in courting favor of the king and his presumptive heir. They had been annoyed by the loss of that favor to, in quotes, foreign knights from France, and once they had that control back, or at least had driven out those knights, the French, of course, once more exiled, the Allies returned to the fold, and supporters of Montfort evaporated. Henry, in January of 1264, had left for France to negotiate with the King of France over the demands of Montfort in Amiens. He was able to put Montfort and his allies back down again on the ladder during this process as the French king sided with Henry. But Henry authorized Mortimer, Hamo Lestrange, and James Aldley to negotiate with Llewellyn to keep him from attempting to take lands from Mortimer. Obviously, they were concerned that Llewellyn would use the king's absence to his advantage. And late in 1263, Llewellyn had finally driven the English out of Gwyneth by taking Disearth and Diganui, castles which had been the last remaining English strongholds in the Four Cantrefs. Once again, Llewellyn had achieved military success while Henry was absent. On the ford of Montgomery, Llewellyn was supposed to meet them on January 13, 1264. The king wanted to secure a truce at least until Easter, but did not fully remove the idea of an actual peace treaty. Lord Cornwall had tried for a short time to keep the meeting, and possibly to meet at a later date if that couldn't be arrived at. Unfortunately for everyone, Prince Edward returned from France and was feeling ready for a fight and put an end to that idea. Edward, of course, was never one to make nice, and this, of course, was no different. It was early 1264, and it was going to be the beginning of one bloody year. Montfort and Llewellyn were now making a concerted effort to work together, fully allied to take out the barons in the march and others, such as the king and his heir, to their benefit. Initially, of course, this wasn't the original idea. Edward had, in effect, forced Montfort into the hands of Llewellyn. They had no choice. The king continued to avoid actual negotiations, and there was little desire to accommodate the Welsh leader or rebellious baron. Unfortunately for the king and his heir, they were fighting a very couple of very smart soldiers who were very well versed in the tactics of the English in warfare and in negotiations. Llewellyn and Montfort together in South Wales, while the English monarchists forces were trying to protect Marcher Lord Holdings, and of course they were also trying to cut off Montfort from Llewellyn, and the Welsh and Baron forces 
took Radnor as de Montfort entered Welsh territory to help his new ally in this attack. It, far from cutting them off, they actually ended up putting them together and keeping them together. Edward attempted another move only to be besieged in Gloucester and ended up running away, surviving by simple luck and wits. Then the battle happened from this point on in English lands as opposed to Welsh ones. The Welsh were left alone as the two sides had little for Llewellyn, and he was obviously not prepared to leave with his forces out of Welsh lands, or at least himself anyway. His goal had been to destabilize the monarchists and the marcher lords, and to this point that had been accomplished. At least that is the way it is written by various chroniclers. Dr. Smith suggests that a lot of academics actually think that this may have been a mistake on Flewellyn's part, and that very simply, had he gone on and actually gone full on with Montfort, he might have been able to help him succeed quicker and to take more land. Uh, at least that was the perception anyway. But Flewellyn hardly had reason to trust a man who needed his help because he had no better option. Simply, Desperation does not make for a solid ally. In fact, one would make the case that de Montfort could have seen the Welsh as allies of convenience, and once in charge, he may have turned on them in the way all the other English lords had done. If Henry and Edward were duplicitous and filled with treachery and wishing ill of Llewellyn, one would have said that the rest of the English nobility were little better in their thinking. As well, Llewellyn may have worried about the consequences if he sided too firmly with the Baron and Henry won again. On the other side of the argument, Smith suggests that maybe Llewellyn sent men and supplies to the Allies and actually privately still supported the war effort while publicly remaining, in quotes, neutral in the English war. To be fair, either suggestion is could be likely. Montford and Edward now traded victories, just as Edward had gotten the upper hand at the battle that they had fought in the previous part of the spring. At the Battle of Lewis in May 1264, the monarchists lost both their place and their control. Monfort won again, once again had won the day, and Edward was once again taken into protective custody, and his uncle, Simon de Monfort, was the uncrowned king. Henry and Edward were once again dominated by the barons and the provisions of Oxford, However, during the negotiations, the marcher lords were to retain their freedom and control of their areas of influence, something that might have let Llewellyn a bit nonplussed. These lords were as much his problem as Edward and Henry. Mortimer had been a thorn in Llewellyn's side often enough that his return and retention of power must have been something to irk Llewellyn. In fact, Mortimer would continue to be a thorn in both of their sides, as he would eventually lead to the intervention by both men, Montford and Llewellyn, in July of 1264 to try and deal with him, and in the process they destroyed castles in Hereford, and as well as destroying and raiding and pillaging through towns, and generally forcing Mortimer and Aldley, among others, to submit to Llewellyn and Montford at Montgomery. However, the Welsh way of doing things conflicted with the English. Montford was never going to take the opposing barons out. Mortimer and others may be defeated frequently, but they were allowed to keep their lives, and in some cases their lands, and at worst were being told to leave for a year. As Professor Morrison points out, this may be down to a chivalric way of dealing with other nobles. They were often kept alive and ransomed, but rarely killed in European circles at this time. It was seen as something unchristian and something a knight wouldn't do to another noble. You were free to kill, of course, his vassals and his poor people, but you weren't really allowed to kill the nobility. That was definitely frowned upon by the church. Well, that was a problem. In Welsh lands, this was not how they did things. If one thing this podcast and the study of Welsh history has shown, Llewellyn rarely tried to bargain with people he saw as traitors. It usually meant their deaths, or at least their expulsion. You can imagine that Monfort's unwillingness to fight his enemies unfettered must have left Llewellyn wondering what he got himself into. He spent most of 1264 helping Simon to hold power, only to see his enemies largely escape his wrath, and not being held to account for anything they were doing. 
Mortimer in particular remained loyal to the king and a major threat to the Anglo-Welsh alliance. Had Mortimer been executed, who knows whether Henry, and by extension Edward, would have been able to regain their place in the English throne. By the end of 1264, Llewellyn may not have cared, but it was looking like the Earl Montford was starting to position his sons as presumptive heirs to the crown. As they held Edward captive until March 1265, only offering to release him if he agreed to give up all his lands and forfeit his title, and if that on pain of him bringing in foreign knights in his service to England. This appeared to be a positioning to encourage the hot-headed Edward to put himself in a bad position. Whether this mattered to Llewellyn, it would certainly be yet another grievance between him and Edward, since the prince, of course, had supported Monfort in this period. Meanwhile, the marcher lord slowly began to regain control of the march. First in Shropshire, this gave the royalists a power base right beside Llewellyn's territory. This must have been the start of the split with de Monfort. By June 1265, the power of the Earl was on the wane, and to shore it up, he finally offered a peace deal to Llewellyn. Why did Monfort wait? It was one thing Llewellyn had wanted from the beginning. His entire issue with Henry since the truce of 1258 was that he wanted peace, a final recognition of the Welsh nation within the English hegemony. And this was not a modern nation as we would understand it, but rather an acknowledgement that the Welsh were in charge of their own local affairs and were giving homage to their overlord, the King of England. By June 1265, this treaty likely, too, was too little too late to make any difference for either side. By this point, Montford was desperate and needed Llewellyn to hold his part in keeping Mortimer and Clifford off his back. Then, Gilbert de Clare also joined the monarchist's side, which would not and could not have helped matters. Gilbert the Red was an ally of Montfort through most of the last couple of years, due to his anger over the way the king had treated his inheritance. But he sought to share power with Montfort, who apparently was not very interested in doing this. This led to Gilbert defecting once again, and once again, Montfort lost a key supporter on the march. Mortimer, de Clare, and Roger Clifford were behind the escape of Edward in Hereford, which would bring the enemies of Llewellyn all together and allowed them to go to war with Montfort, to eventually defeat him at Evansham. With Edward on the loose, Montfort came to the table with an offer for Llewellyn, signed by Henry. It gave him much of what he had wanted in 1258, including the recognition of his right to the title, Prince of Wales. From June 12th, 1265 to June 22nd, the two sides negotiated from a distance. There was no open negotiations face to face. It was merely sharing and editing of documents. The treaty called Llewellyn the Prince of Wales and Lord of Snowdon. He was to keep all the territory he had taken to that point, and in some cases held that the crown would help him achieve all that he wanted in the future. Henry would not hold the previous truces as requirements, and all other demands were withdrawn. In exchange, Llewellyn and his descendants must pay homage to the king, and eventually they must pay the king £20,000 over the next ten years. All the various Welsh lords must swear fealty to Llewellyn. As well, the Welsh must provide military support when called upon by their king. This agreement would fall to pieces with the defeat of Montford, but... It would actually remain the basis of the final negotiations between Llewellyn and Henry in 1267. After finishing off the treaty, Montford moved towards Bristol through the lands of southeastern Wales. If de Montford was trying to defeat Mortimer and specifically declare by wreaking havoc in Monmouth and Glamorgan, it failed rather spectacularly, eventually leading to his own death at Evesham. Chester was restored to Edward thereafter, and once again, Llewellyn dealt with the problem of royalists bumping against his homeland. Once again, this forced Llewellyn to hand the English lords defeats, as he beat back Hamo Lestrange, and eventually forced the English late in 1265 to negotiate yet another uneasy truce, the first since 1262. It was then that the papacy finally had decided it had enough and it sent a legate to 
create the final peace treaty. Cardinal Otto Buono was sent to England to finally end the strife brought on by Llewellyn, Henry, and Montfort. It was apparently to the cardinal that he was given this arduous task, and more to the point, something that when he was originally tasked, Montford was still alive. By the time he reached England, he was dead. And so with that, the cardinal had his hands full. Llewellyn was in no mood to have the English demand anything more than what was given in 1265. Meanwhile, Henry might have been back in control, and Edward and his marcher lords were in the ascendancy, but Llewellyn wanted his pound of flesh, and his victories against the lords had showed he was very willing to continue the fight if need be. The fact that the Welsh would continue to fight on, in face of a united England, and continue to give them a bloody nose, shows just how good Llewellyn was in battle. He was also not willing to take the king's side in benefit of the doubt. In other words, he didn't believe him to be trustworthy and didn't want to respect that level of trust to be given. Part of the delay in negotiations, which would go through in 1267, boiled down to a conflict among the various winners at Evesham. Gilbert, while an ally, was not a friend of Mortimer. He, in fact, felt a great deal of affinity to the reformer movement on the de Montfort side, which is part of the reason why he was on that side initially. This is what led to conflicts over the final disposition of the supporters of Montford. By September 1266, the cardinal was frustrated and depressed as he could not seem to bring the English to the table. He could, they couldn't even agree on the basics of what they wanted. His letter to the papacy marked some of this dis discouragement. Amidst all of this was the conflict between de Clare and Llewellyn, who were in fighting over lands in the northern part of Glamorgan. It would only be eventually resolved by a treaty between the two in the spring of 1267, which, while de Clare would seemingly be an ally for Llewellyn to use to defeat the excesses of Mortimer, seemingly their positioning and attempts to take land from one another outweighed their self-interest in this matter. But nonetheless, with de Clare satisfied in June, on the basis of the negotiations of the end of the war, those who fought against the king were then allowed to keep their titles and in some cases keep their land, which allowed him to save face with his former allies and keep Mortimer from claiming yet more power. Llewellyn would now be able to negotiate his own peace treaty with the king. And for once, Henry seemed to actually be interested in doing so. In July, Henry sent a letter to Llewellyn asking to meet him on the Montgomery on August 2nd, 1267. This was to begin the final negotiations for peace. However, eventually negotiations began in earnest in Shrewsbury on August 28th. And after a great deal of negotiations, they largely ended up near enough to where they had been in 1265, and by September 21st, the basis of an agreement had been reached, and enough of a crossroads had been met that Henry left it in the hands of the cardinal to effectively finish the negotiations. And so it was on September 25th, 1267, at long last, almost ten years later, Henry and Llewellyn had a peace treaty. September 29th, 1267, Llewellyn finally did a former fealty to his liege lord, Henry III, King of England. In fact, and on paper, Llewellyn was acknowledged, at last, as Prince of Wales and Supreme Overlord of the native Welsh. This, of course, is only the very beginning of all of the troubles that would then come from this. And one thing we haven't really discussed yet, and we'll certainly go into at length in the later episodes, is how his agreements with Monford may have also included a marriage pact between himself and one of Monford's daughters. We don't have any for sure knowledge of this, but it would make some sense, because that marriage pact would tie him in little different, really, from how Llewellyn the Great was tied into King John through the marriage of his bastard daughter, 
And I think that was kind of the idea. You would have Monfort as the king of England, or at least controlling England, much in the same way that the uh, the Earl of York would do later during the War of the Roses. And his heirs would become the presumptive kings of England after him. And so being tied into that by blood would make it easier to work with one another and to create an alliance with one another that would have a lasting perspective. In some ways, the fall of de Montfort was probably the signal for the end of Llewellyn's ability to take control. But he did the best with a bad situation and grabbed his peace treaty that he'd been so desperate for. It's a peace treaty that will last for almost 10 years, in amongst some skirmishes that, of course, happened constantly on the Welsh borders during this period. But nonetheless, it's an important treaty. It's one that has great significance both to the Welsh and to the English at this time period, and realistically sets the stage for what is to come, as Edward, of course, will remember the slights that he received over the last few years from Llewellyn and others. And certainly one has to think that that played a part in his hostility to the Welsh. The other big key to all of this is the 20,000 pounds that were being required from the Welsh, a country, let's be honest, that was poor at best, that didn't really have a lot of monetary ability to raise and didn't have a tax structure as such. So we're not in the same ability to fund these kind of things in the same way that the English were. And even the English at this point had had financial struggles. That was exactly why Henry himself had ran into difficulties with the barons in the first place, was over his overreaching for financial gain. So while this resolves some key points and sets in place what should have been a sub-monarchy under the auspices of the English monarchy, it of course sets the trigger steps that lead to the end of Welsh independence in whole. But we're nowhere near that yet. We get to talk a bit more about that next time. And until next time, I hope you all have a great day. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so at the Welsh History Pod on Twitter. You can find out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com, where we have so many other things that we do over and above this podcast. As well, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you just want to send me an email, you can do that at Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to follow some of the other things I'm doing and up to, you can do that at Linstead DM on Twitter. Until next time, everyone, take care, have a great day, and farewell. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. I'm Daniel Norcross. And I'm Rory Dollard. And between us, we are England Cricket on 99.94. We'll be every week looking at the ups, the downs, the runners, the riders, the news and the views on all things English cricket. And believe you me, there are plenty of ups and downs. Join us, England Cricket on 99.94.